You are listening to Bang Radio. Welcome to Bang Radio. Steve Maeda here with part two of our interview with Ryan Yakovievic. Hopefully you have watched part one or listened to it on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube. We have those three feeds going. Subscribe to us on all of them. And of course, if you're listening on iTunes or Stitcher, man, you can watch the video interview of this. It's pretty damn cool. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, man, there's literally a hundred more episodes giving you advice on how to be a better man and how to live this social dynamic to be a better man. Uh, on on the iTunes and Stitcher feed, on this pod uh, on this part of the episode, we're actually rewinding about 10, 20 seconds to get into this conversation about crime, punishment, blame, and how judgment comes from disconnect. It's a pretty cool thing, man. And if you want to get the liner notes to this episode, some articles that Ryan's written and inter- and articles that I've written and our members at TSL have written on that are inspired from this, man, go to thesexuallife.com/slash Ryan Answers. You can download some cool free stuff, watch more videos, but more importantly, you know, check out some of these articles on how culture creates sociopaths. Does that happen? Is that true? You know, how crime and punishment and blame are part of a reaction to our culture. You know, how do we get better with these things? How do we heal a cheating relationship? Go to thesexuallife.com slash Ryan Answers and get plugged into what we're talking about when we're talking about the social dynamic to be the better man. All right, let's dive in to part two. Do this, you would probably just be like, well, I had to pay the bills. The fuck do you care? Go back to your perfect life. Like to this guy, his perception of me is totally different from the way I actually am, yeah. the way I see myself. Yeah, there's so many different theories about this. And, and I, I really believe that humanity really wasn't that evil. You know, we've always fought, we've always no. had tension, but we never killed and sought revenge and all the stuff in this i believe this all comes from like a massive social density and yada 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 and carries over into the whole social and sexual realm which is what i rant about you know forever but what i really like about this idea of what you're talking about is if we could understand you know the the empathy the motive the the connection of why people are doing stuff and just see that they thought they were doing good. And I'm going to take a couple steps back here and just say this. Like if you're doing fucked up shit and it's out of the realm of society and it's, and you want to get in the solution, you can't make an excuse. All right. I don't give a fuck what your family was like, what your race was like, what people say you, if you need to, if you need to change, like let's say with a drug problem, cause this is like the main reference point that I have no shit, man, poverty, Big time abuse, big time, like all these things, all these stresses and pressures, inequality, you know, looking at the roots of addiction because it's a fairly new thing, even though it's, you know, genetic, um, it's a new thing. It's a new thing that keeps getting more and more. But before we look at any of those causes of what you had to deal with, you have to shut the fuck up and, you know, start to, to change and get into an area where you can. So just saying that. Man, what if what if we had that in our mind? What if the the addict, what if the thief, what if the 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 violent man had an outlet? I'm not saying because there shouldn't be without consequence, but what if it had an outlet or some sense of compassion going like, I understand why you're doing that. I yeah. I uh I want to know what that does for you and what is right about that. And that there's a part of beauty within you, man, just think of the lack of. Yeah. Oh, we we can dream, man. We can dream. Yeah. That's, that's something that I I totally think would, would be a much better solution. And before I go any further, let me just say that again, having that attitude doesn't mean you condone or excuse the behavior. And it also doesn't mean you think there should be no punishment. There should absolutely be punishment. But the thing is, It's not going to – there's no cessation of the behavior without understanding, empathy, and change. Like if some guy thinks I'm just like, well, fuck you. You go in a cell every time you're bad. Well, 
he doesn't know any different. If he doesn't have the tools to change, he's just going to go, well, life dealt me this hand and you're punishing me for that? Like, fuck you. And then he's going to get back out. He's going to be more bitter and more resentful, probably meet some worse people while he's in jail. And it's going to make the problem even worse. We need absolutely what you said. You need to connect with these people and go like, look, man, what happened to you to get you in this place? Nobody wakes up and wants to be like you. You don't wake up and go, I want to be a horrible, violent, murderous fiend or something. You know, that's not what enters your head. It's a series of circumstances that get you there. And I'd like to touch quickly on a a really important fundamental psychological law. It's called the fundamental attribution error. And it's the idea that when people are trying to explain behavior and try to explain motives, all they really do is they look at the person, they go, that's a bad person, or he's a fucked up person. And they totally ignore the effect of environment and society on the way you act. And this goes for cheating. Cheating is a big one. Go, oh, well, he's a bad person. Well, no, maybe he was just drunk at the club. Maybe he regretted it totally. But at the time, the environmental factors that were playing on him overwhelmed his inner morals. And that's, it happens to everybody. And to believe otherwise is a really well established as a self-esteem defense mechanism. Because if you think that, you know, bad behavior or bad circumstances or like fucked up horrible things happening has only to do with somebody's character, then you can alleviate the anxiety of having to worry about that by saying, I don't have that character. That's not a problem I'll ever face. I don't ever have to deal with that. And you can just shut it out. And it also cuts off the empathy though too. So it's a really big problem and I wish it was taught and people would understand that more. That was a great point that you brought up. It's a trip because labeling and judgment, you know, by default, they happen. And I think they yeah. do need to happen again, not saying that, it's, it's necessary. Yes, but not in a negative way. That's but all. man, labeling and judgment are, are, can only happen through a disconnection. I need yeah. to somehow see you as different to judge you. But if I can yeah. start to connect and feel the same thing, I won't, I, I won't be able to judge, you know, in true rapport, like, in, so I'm talking about like social theory stuff that I talk about all the time in true rapport, there isn't judgment. There's understanding. You start to understand and justify yeah, and get all these, you know, it's like whatever you're unifying on, it, it does not happen in sex. It does not happen. Like when I hear guys talk about a sexual experience after it's happened, they're like, I hate fuck this chick or I fucked her like whatever. You're actually not thinking that you are somehow in sync with her in this, like whether dominant submissive or, you know, pushing and pulling back and forth that are matching and connecting in a big way. You're just your only way to describe it afterwards is like this you know, through this non-sexual mind. But I think what is interesting about all of this and when it comes to trauma, addiction, dysfunction in a relationship, man, isolation and thinking that you're different, totally fucked up. And let me speak from my experience when I would do whatever, man, when I was doing a lot of drugs, like I, you know, got clean when I was 17, but then relapsed again when I was 20 or yeah, 20. And, um, it's been about 10 years, you know, progressively getting worse with all that sort of stuff. It just it was nice. crazy. You know, so a lot of lying, a lot of cheating, a lot of stealing, a lot of just crazy behavior of, of just whatever. All of it, I wanted to live the best I could possibly live. And if, if I could take a step back, if I could take a break, you know, so it's like I'm fucked up, I'm going crazy, or maybe I hadn't put any chemicals in my body, but still mentally I'm like, you know, in the just not there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just you know, pissed off, angry, or whatever. I remember, I uh, when I was doing some writing on myself, I was writing about my past and my childhood. You know, what if I could talk to myself? I really got into it. Um, if I just had that, you know, moment where I thought, wait a minute, I am good. Yeah. I am. I I wanted to be. There's good. no bad people. You know, if I just thought that that was there, that would be key. Now, I may have thought my actions were good, but there was a huge part of me that whether I consciously thought it or not, and I did not consciously think about it most of the time, thought I'm fucked up. There's a reason why I'm like this. I was told that I, you know, interpreted things that way, whatever. And if people could learn that, man, it would change so fucking much. And that somebody had just told you. Yeah. And when we have a bunch of people blaming and hating, you know, whether I, because I see it in pickup too. You know, fuck women, you know, fuck this. I need to be more powerful. You can never have a good relationship from that. You can never have, you will not have a good sex life. That's what it's the whole motive of it, right? With that. And when I see the critics of pickup, it's like, wait a minute. 
any man would be fucking stupid not to look at how to get better with women who is wanting to better themselves. Like, give me a break. It's all about sex. Sex is not bad. Socializing is not bad. You being so hateful and judgmental makes it once again impossible for for men to have that connection. I just see this huge disconnect happening on both ends. Uh, but but man, I I like that idea. I like that idea. Um, let me ask you this. In an example different from the car thief, mm-hmm. uh, I know you can't get personal about any one mm-hmm. person, but like, where do you see this happen with somebody that let's say like had some abuse? Or I could give an example of my life or some shit, you know? And, um, like like somebody who was wrong. the abuser or somebody who got abused. Ah, uh, man, let's go with the abuser. That would be interesting. Well, the. When, the when abuser people, doesn't always know they're the abuser, man. No, man. A lot of the times they yeah. don't think they are. And that's the thing is, again, we're, we're talking perception here is when somebody's being abused and the other person thinks that they're, they're helping or that they're enforcing some kind of like, righteous punishment or something is deserved it's because they look at somebody. Yeah, it's just exactly. And I had, um, I had one client and um, they were against their will forced into electroshock therapy. Mm-hmm which is something that up until that point, I honestly thought didn't really happen anymore. Well, actually, it's like an, ar- an interesting archaic thing. fact about electroshock therapy, it depends on how it was being used, but is a punishment and reward thing, horrible, horrible thing. But when yeah. you do get electrocuted, your brain chemistry does rebalance. And that's an interesting phenomenon that does happen. So. Oh, being, well, I'm not familiar. Being a light designer in theater and having been electrocuted a lot, let me tell you, I was happy <laughs> for a week every time that that happened. <laughs> really? That's kind of a weird no, man, it's, phenomenon, man. You start going back and like poking your finger in the socket or something, man. Yeah, I forget the stats. I mean, they're like 15 years old from what I saw, but it was more effective than most other forms of, of therapy for depression. But it was a, it was a byproduct. Or it was like a, a – it wasn't expected that that would actually um, – Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think um, – where you're talking shock stimulus therapy. I'm talking this person was like yeah. b- bolted down, yeah. essentially strapped down and shocked until they lost years of their life. And, and they, this person, that was their main issue was that their, so their family thought it was appropriate to do this mm. to them because yeah. they didn't understand their mental illness. And so the abusers in this case, the family, they were extremely religious and I'm not saying that all religion is bad or anything. I don't even want to open that can of worms, but the beliefs that they got from their religion, which they interpreted very literally put them in a position where they viewed this as bad or negative or, you know, something that was afflicting them that needed to be destroyed. And so they were willing to destroy the person along with the illness if that's what it took. Mm, Wow. So from the point of the abuser, it's more about their belief that they're helping or giving what's deserved or giving what's appropriate. And I think it's actually harder to um, reorient uh, their perception than it is somebody who was abused because also, they tend to have a, a lot more clear. Uh, yeah, clear it's like it. how could you reorient it if that's their culture? If they are yeah. truly living the standard, you know, how could exactly. you? It's, it's really tough, man, really yeah. tough. Yeah, it, it, but – once again, as you were talking, hold on, the, the door popped open somehow. But like when, as you were talking, um, you know, it made me think about uh, how can we learn to get back to the compassion or the empathy or that understanding of – or do you think that that is even the answer to go to when stuff is that fucked up? Like somebody who has gone through that trauma, somebody who has gone through that abuse – um, so this time, the person who has been abused, how do we get back to that sort of compassion of like understanding somebody, knowing that nobody meant to do wrong, uh, working through that sort of pain or, or disconnect? Well, to put it bluntly, I was just like, look, um, you're going to have to accept that they're fucking crazy. They're not in touch with reality. And what they're doing is inexcusable, it's despicable, it's disgusting, and it's absolutely abhorrently wrong. That being said, they don't think that. And so if you want to continue on your life without holding on to all kinds of crazy negative emotions that just eat you up every day, you have to do whatever 
you know, mental gymnastics you need to to get to a point where you can realize that. And you can realize that they didn't want to hurt you. Their goal wasn't to cause you pain or suffering. Their, their intentions were good. And I think that's the thing that separates a lot of people philosophically is some people care a lot about, okay, what are the consequences? You know, if the consequences of an action were good, it's good. If they were bad, it's bad. Whereas other people think, well, if your intentions were good, it's a good action. I think there's a, a, a kind of a combination of both where mm-hmm. if the intentions are good, then there's no point in punishing that person because they're already doing the best that they can do. The only thing you can do at that point to change their behavior is to change their perception of what is good and to change their perception of you know what they're capable of and go from there. Man, what what do you think it is that makes somebody in an abuser or what is it or somebody who's a drug addict or something like that? What what goes into that recipe? Uh well, there's there's a lot. Um one is not having support. If you have people to connect with and make sense of things, then you don't really need to escape. Ultimately, I think um, most people who do drugs, at least at first, it starts as a voluntary escape. Oh, it's something you do to, to get away. You're like whatever you're going through, it's just like I just need a break for a minute. You do whatever drug that you know your drug of choice. You feel good, and then you go back to reality. And then the problem obviously is when it alters your brain chemistry. You start to need it to feel normal. And that's when addiction takes over. But in terms of like being abusive and stuff, it's just a lack of empathy for a very very small subset of the population. Um, their mirror neurons don't function right. Mirror neurons. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, listeners are familiar, so I'll just explain it quick. Um, There are neurons in your brain that are active when you imagine what other people are going through. And that is when they're doing a physical action. If you're watching a baseball player swing a bat, the same neurons fire in your brain, the same area that if you were actually doing that action. And the same thing, if somebody's going through pain and you look at them, you feel the same, uh, well, you don't feel the same thing, but mirror neurons fire and you get a simulated emotion. And because your brain is simulating what you think they're going through, it allows you guys to connect. And with people who are abusive, they typically have uh, very inactive or inefficient mirror neurons. And that's due to genetic factors, the way they're raised and a whole bunch of other stuff. But it comes down with an inability to relate. But there are genetic factors and there are probably social factors in that. But that being said, we didn't always have, I mean, so if they, if it was purely through genetic and not through social, usually it's a combination of the two or what I would Mm -hmm. theorize. Right. But, um, man, if it was always there, how come we're seeing more of it now? And if it was always there and it's genetic, how do we emotionally go in and start to massage that into a new kind of, through CBT or whatever, you know, sort of. Yeah, if, it, if, it, if it's genetic, there's not much I can do. I mean, uh, if you're sociopathic, like psychopath isn't a thing anymore. That's been replaced with um, sociopathy. And that's the idea. That you do just you guys follow really... the DSM-4 in Canada or? A uh, five. No, DSM-5, yeah, yeah. You do? Yeah, yeah, we have the same thing. It's yeah, so all they did take North out, America's all kind somebody of synced was, up. Somebody was talking about on one of my calls that they took out one of the psychopath or sociopaths. So they I did lost take you out. For me. Oh, so somebody on one of uh, our calls was actually saying on the DSM five they took out one of them, psychopath or sociopath, but they did take yes. out. It did, they took out psycho. They just changed um, psycho uh, psychopath to sociopath because psycho has a lot of different connotations. Saying if somebody's like wild or crazy, and that's not the case. People who you know have been termed psychopathic killers in the past, it wasn't that they were insane. They just couldn't relate to other people. Like imagine, um, I had a neuroscientist prof who explained this really well. He's like, imagine if instead of looking around and seeing human beings and understanding they have emotions and goals and desires, imagine if you look around and you just see like stuffed animals or computers or something. You don't give a fuck about them. They're an inanimate object. And that's the way these people perceive reality. So it's like if a giant teddy bear is in your way of getting into your house and the only way to remove that obstacle is just to kill it, well, you will. It's, it's, it's not a thing. Who gives a shit if you like stab it? It's a, it's a knife through, you know, a physical portion of their body. It's not like an actual um, consequence that has a real effect. They just, they have a really distorted view of things. Now, okay, here's the other thing that I'll say with that. So a sociopath or whatever we're calling it, a sociopath sees things as static, you know, non-emotional. Yeah, inanimate. Totally. Check this out. 
And I want to know your thoughts on it because I think you have a good mind for this sort of shit. When people are involved with a cause, when people are involved with anger, when people are involved in something that is making them feel pain or distance from other people, they're going to feel that shit. Do, when, so these people online that are talking shit on whatever their cause is, you know, some uh, okay, race filled fucking okay. thing, then everybody has, they have made it so they can have that detachment from people so that when they do talk to the dude at the gas station or the person at the cafe, they can detach themselves from it and see them as an opinion rather than a person. And so that's an awesome point. So I think like in, in some way, socially, we are developing this to a higher level, you know, yeah. through whatever, man, population density over stimuli, yada, yada, yada. But man, think about this. When you're dealing with a, a person that you know, could be a client or whatever, man, when I know somebody is fucked up, you know, and they are pissed off, they're in pain, they just got cheated on, they just got in a car accident, they, whatever the fuck happened to them, they start to distance themselves from a whole huge amount of the population categorize label detach and then see i mean dude we do it with war all the time you know we do it with football teams or hockey teams you know it, it it's an interesting phenomenon so i think in many ways human human beings are capable of it and that's where i think that social element to it you know the non-genetic thing is is huge um, cause I know some very loving people that I've seen them be some of the most fucked up people and detached and cruel yeah. and all of that. It's really interesting. Environmental but, factors, man. Yeah, man. I think, uh, I think it, it changes so much. Uh, so that being said, they don't have the genetic thing, but they have stepped over the line into the red zone, into the black zone, into the red yeah. zone. Oh, fuck. What, uh, um, Man, what do you say to somebody like that? You know, what, what is oh, it's the, the well, the, the best thing to do, I think, is to understand it. And, you know, if, if you'll humor me, we'll do like a 15 second experiment here to kind of demonstrate the concept behind that. Um, I, I'm going to describe somebody and I want you to visualize that person in your mind. And then when we're done, just yeah. tell me like what you came up with. Um, somebody who is the leader of the chess club. You know, gets really good grades in school, maybe um, captain of the debate team, uh, socially awkward and, and shy, not really good at conversation, um, not really that athletic. What kind of person do you think of? Bobby like, what Fisher. do they look like? <laughs> Bobby Fisher is an old man. Um, no, man, like a nerdy guy, big glasses, you know, hair combed in some awkward way and unkept. <laughs> yeah and that's you know whatever people come up with the point is that you're able to visualize physical traits when i didn't describe any and that's called the representativeness heuristic so if you see somebody who exhibits those traits you build a connection in your mind yeah and then without even being exposed to what they look like but only the traits your brain immediately fills in all these blanks and that's what we do every day we take a small section of reality and we use it to fill in all this other crazy shit that may or not be true. And when somebody's going through that distancing, they're experiencing like a like a horrible thing, maybe a car crash, maybe somebody just cut them off and they're screaming at them. So now instead of engaging that person and understanding them, they're exposed to say a heuristic, the representative heuristic that they have of an angry person as somebody who's shitty in every other area of life. So instead of recognizing that this is just a normal good person, like we talked about, there are no bad people, it's a normal good person in a fucked up situation and that environmental pressure is causing them to act in a fucked up way, they view them as just like a horrible demonized version of a human, just a piece of shit with no redeeming qualities, mm. not worth talking to and they totally just blast them and, and like you said, they disconnect totally because they don't see any Anything there worth connecting to. So if you understand human behavior and you understand people, that's one way to get around that. The, the less understanding you have of how people work and function and the less um, open you are about the possibility that beneath these seemingly bad acts or negative acts are, are good people with other good qualities, well, you're not going to connect with them unless you believe that. So I would say that the best way to get around it is just through knowledge, the education. Yeah, yeah. What what is something that 
that people can do to get happier, man, to get in a more healthy mental state, you know, so that they, they can live a better life. To get happier. Well, that's different for everybody. I mean, the, the, the most effective thing I would think for general advice is to fix flaws before you worry about improving things. Like if you're making uh, 80 grand, you're not really going to be that much happier making like 140 grand. You know what I mean? But if you're making like 12 grand a year, the increase in happiness to going to like 50 or 60 even is going to be huge. And likewise, if you weigh like um, 190 pounds and you're six foot and you're pretty well built, putting on an extra 20 pounds isn't really going to help. But if you're like 130 and you put on, you know, 30 pounds or something like that, you're feeling a lot better about your self-image, that's going to be really good. I think the default state is happiness. I think the idea, and I think this might kind of connect with what you're talking about with happiness being externalized in our society to a great extent, is that happiness is a default state. It's just negative pressures remove happiness. Like if you're average or adequate, you're happy. If you view something as being below average, then your happiness is kind of withheld as, you know, some primitive way to motivate you to go and change things so you can be more accepted or more successful or whatever. You know, I actually think that there is no concept of happiness in the default state. <laughs> you know, if we were really living as how we were born to be, we wouldn't really, you know, think of a good day or bad day or uh, we didn't even think of purpose or any of that stuff. But now that we have like so many things hitting and all these different definitions, uh, I mean, shoot, you know, with more stimuli, more factors, there have to be more rules, more borders, more definitions to define the moment. And, uh, you know, with, with human nature, that's definitely happened. But, uh, man, it's, it's interesting that even with population densities, different emotions, different concepts, different ways of organizing people, they, they become very consistent. And uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. But... Um, that being said, uh, you know, getting kind of late with all that sort of stuff, but relationships, a big thing, you know, to bring it back to where we started at, you know, <laughs> what was your, you know, man, how did you find getting in a good relationship? You've been in one for six years. You've lived together for six oh, years. Yeah. Lived together for six years. From yeah. a time in, you know, dabbling in the seduction scene and seeing how people yes. did that. Uh, what, what changed? What was different? You know, what made well, you be able to have that? Um, the, the main reason I got into it was I was looking for answers. Um, I just got out of a really bad relationship. I was cheated on and totally, you know, destroyed me. Like we talked about earlier, I went to a bunch of counselors and none of them could help. And so I was looking around the internet and I came across a couple of things. None were very good. And then my buddy was like, Hey, there's this guy, Zan, you should, you should come down and meet in Calgary. And I was like, well, all right. How long it, ago did not? you meet Zan? Wow, uh, two thousand and seven, I think. Whoa, wow! It was a while ago, man. Yeah, wow. it was a long time ago. He had short hair then. Yeah, he had short. Yeah, he short had hair. Little, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we both we both did. I have a picture, man. I was trying to dig it up, but uh, I couldn't find the power cord from my um, hard hard drive. When I do, though, I'll post it to your Facebook or something. It's hilarious. Yeah. I look like a baby. He looks all fucking different and shit. It's it's funny, but uh, Van's yeah, my buddy's now. like he's fifty. Zan's fifty. Yeah. Holy shit, dude. Yeah, I couldn't believe that's it. wild. Yeah. No, he doesn't show it at all. He actually, I think, looks younger now than he did when I met him. If that makes any sense. <laughs> It's true, man. He's got like some some mystical gypsy potion. Yeah, seriously, over. man. Seriously. Bucharest or wherever he is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, I was um the first time I ever set foot in a bar was when I was twenty. I had terrible anxiety about going to a bar. And so I went to this, you know, pickup speech thing. These guys from Calgary were speaking and um I went out like it was basically a pub crawl. It was amazing. I had a wicked time. And um then one of the guys I met there, I was telling him my story. We we're all kind of like sharing our, you know, motives for getting into it. And he's like, Yeah, come down to Calgary. So we took like a three hour road trip down there and you know, Zan's concepts really connected with me. It was more about the stuff I was interested in. I don't really care about, you know, getting laid or fucking a bunch of different girls. It never really appealed to me. Um, I just wanted to find somebody I really connected with and to have like a long relationship with and to share something meaningful, to build a life together. That was my goal from the outset. So I think the first thing that um, kind of primed me and made me able to do that was I wanted to. I was watching a thing too, um, RSD Tim. Ah, Tim's Natural Tim. 
Natural tin. See that guy was he was a one of those guys who I'm like, you know I'm what? Lording, Even I'm lording over yeah, the loading the club, <laughs> loading the. We used to do that, man. My buddy Curtis, we go to the club. We're loading, bro. <laughs> or a lame little way, but uh, but yeah, Tim. Tim's one of those guys who I really connected with because he seemed like just a normal guy. Yeah, that was the biggest thing. I was like, I don't want some dude who never knew how to be social naturally. Kind of that I don't connect with the whole robotic. Mm-hmm methodical that just never resonated with me yeah. so tim was a guy zan was a guy and these guys were all preaching that kind of stuff they're saying like look why do you want to do this and so i actually sat down and wrote it out i'm like i want somebody to have adventures with i want somebody to you know travel with i want somebody to share my life with and like all these different you know things that might sound lame to a lot of people but whatever and um i i really did try though i went out i did the whole wingman thing i was going out like five six nights a week for months man and i was like me and a couple of the guys you started the edmonton it. yeah me and a couple of guys we started the edmonton like later community whatever you want to call it we had the forum the weekly meetups and all that shit and um we would go to the club all the time and you know like I had fun drinking with the guys, but whenever it came time to like do approaches or Sarge or whatever, I was like, this is fucking weird, man. I do not, this feels awkward as hell to me. And no matter how much I did it, it didn't, it didn't fit with me. And a lot of guys are like, oh, you need to take boot camps. You need to do this. I'm like, nah, man, I, I think that it's just not what I want. And I just don't know what I want. And that was an important step was going out and trying that and figuring it out. And that's the second thing is like before I got into a relationship, I did a lot of the stuff I wanted to do. Before I did pickup, I went and lived with my buddies down in Toronto for three months. And all I did was drink, do drugs and party. That's it. That's all we did all the time. I got out of my system. I did that. And I did all the things that I thought would kind of interfere with me having a relationship. And then from there, um, after like four months of going out four or five, six nights a week, I don't even know how I kept my job, to be honest with you. <laughs> I realized like this is crazy. I don't like, where am I going? I'm just going to keep doing this. I'm going to be like 50, 60 or whatever, just like slaying girls at the club. Like that's going to be my life. And so I was like, whatever, I'm just going to take a break. I'm going to go sit with myself in my room. And when I start feeling that anxiety coming on, instead of running off to the club, drinking and talking to girls to distract myself, I'm going to figure out why I feel that way. And there was a lot of me. I just wasn't comfortable with who I was. I didn't like myself. I didn't like Mm -hmm. a lot about myself, man. It was a pretty low place. And it was funny as I sorted through that and like weeks after I decided no more talking to girls, no more going out or anything. I was at a house party and my buddy was DJing and there was this girl there who, uh, (laughs) thought it was weird that I wasn't talking to any of the girls. And, um, she actually thought I was gay. And if, if I showed you the picture of what I was wearing that night, you would understand it. We were at the casino and I had a lucky shirt and it was like a shiny, like yeah, yeah, pink, yeah. shiny blue shirt. I look like a, like a queer magician or something, you know? And so she comes up to me and I think, what did you say? It was like, it was like, are, are nice guys danger. better kissers than no. girls or something? And I was like, what? <laughs> and then after that, she came back around and I was like, well, let's find out. And we made out and stuff and we started talking and she stole my coat. I wanted to leave, but she stole my coat and it, like, it was minus 30 that night. So it was, yeah. And so it was minus 30. So I literally like, I couldn't go out with my, without my jacket. And so I was waiting on like, Oh man, drunk girls, Jesus. And then, um, I finally get my coat back and then we actually started talking. We really connected that night and everything. And, you know, we exchanged numbers and I'm like, yeah, I got this basement suite. And uh, the actual truth was I was living in my mom's basement. It wasn't a basement suite. I just, I lived in my mom's basement, but I was like, I can't tell her that. It's like, she'll never, like, she seems really cool. I don't want to miss out on this. So, you know, I was like, yeah, just come check out my basement suite. And, you know, we started hanging out more and more and kind of took it from there. And I was always straight up. I always, I hate game playing. I hate the idea of, you know, waiting to call she's over there she's laughing hard right now at my my version of the story i'm sure hers would be a bit different Um, (laughs) do you want to add something no i just you're trying to show off so hard oh she's saying i was trying to show off really hard that's true yeah Yeah, she's like i was on the doorstep i actually remember that yeah i'm going like beat ass red i'm so embarrassed that i used to be like that um my buddy's like yeah go talk to her bro and she was out sitting on the step and i was like hey I was like, so posturing around and stuff. And she just kind of looks at me weird. And I was like, you know, uh, next week I 
I'm in a Muay Thai tournament, you know, I'm, I, I fight, maybe you want to come check it out. And she's like, you can stop trying so hard. And I was <laughs> like, oh no, I've been discovered. And I was like still in PUA mode, right? I was like, well, what do I do? She sees right through me. And that was one of the things that really attracted me. I'm like, she can see my blind spots. So I'm like, that's pretty insightful. I'm, I'm a really reflective person and I can't see this stuff. And she's like, she's got my number. She knows what I'm up to right away. And I was like, that's really wild. I was like, I, I want to get to know this woman a little better. And so we took it from there, man. And the first night we met, I'm like, we're going to be together for a long time. And she kind of looked at me. I could tell she thought I was like a psycho or a creep or something. And I probably kind of was, I think I'm kind of a creepy <laughs> guy. Maybe that's just part of who I am. But, uh, yeah, I just told her straight up. Right. I'm like, look, I really like you. I'm going to be with you for a long time. And the honesty and the willingness to put that out there to put myself out there to be vulnerable to rejection, I think was the other really big thing. What, what traits made this relationship work? Because you didn't learn that stuff in the seduction community. You know, what, no, fuck no, oh, man. What were those hurdles for you? And I think guys are really curious about that. Yeah, well, the, the big challenges for me were like, why why do I want a relationship so much? And I think it's that I thought I needed somebody else to grow. And I think for me, I, I really did. And uh, I think a lot of guys aren't open to that idea that in in some ways, being with somebody can make you a better person in, in respects that you wouldn't be able to achieve on your own. You just th- having somebody around you all the time, it's almost like it's the closest thing you can get to having somebody else experience your life and give you a different perspective. And like we talked about with counseling, the toughest part is I'm going off of what they're telling me and that's so skewed and it's so distorted. Mm. And so all my distortions with her being around me so much she can see all of that and she would call me out on a lot of stuff and I really appreciated that and if you're not open to that or if you get defensive or if you push people away because of that you're not going to be able to be in a relationship because you have to be able to trust your partner to expose those parts of you and to help you grow and if you're not in a relationship to grow then what are you doing right a lot of guys I remember one thing um, a guy on your Facebook wall said you know oh relationships are good because the sex is easier you know you don't have to work as hard I'm like well yeah at first but <laughs> totally right yeah but later on I mean that's what leads to a lot of people going into sexless marriages is they stop trying man and God. like you, it's I'm that's, sure at some point you've experienced the same thing where you, totally. you guys got to like work you got to come together totally. and, and some guys are like look well I keep going in these, you know, one year relationships. I'm like, look, a relationship starts after your first major argument because before that it's just convenience. You know, you're just, you're together and it works. And so just virtue of momentum, you keep going. When you have something you have to overcome and you have to make a conscious decision to work something out in order to continue, that's the start of a relationship, in my opinion. And that's another thing a lot of guys aren't willing to do in terms of hurdles. You know, a big argument happens, you're like, well, fuck it, we're not compatible. Or, you know, like um, buddy who cheated and then left his wife for his affair partner. The idea that other relationships are the problem. Whatever you go through in a relationship, you're probably going to have the same problems in other relationships because it's not relationships that are the problem. It's what you're bringing to the table. Like we talked about earlier, whether you succeed or fail in your relationship is based a lot on one, what are you bringing? What are they bringing? And two, how are you going to deal with that? Are you willing to work through it? Are you willing to change? There's this thing I hate when people post, I don't need to change for anybody, you know, like Marilyn Monroe quotes and shit like that. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Don't change if you don't want to. Don't change to make somebody else happy. But if that change would be a positive thing in your life and it would be something that could bring you closer with another person and it could benefit you, then why resist it? Just because somebody else said it? Like PUA guys, in my experience, tend to be so insecure that if somebody else says something – they're not able to discern yeah, whether or not they're being like a mom. Yeah. Totally, man. You yeah. nailed it. And it's so incredibly frustrating. I actually stopped working with PUA guys for the most part in terms of counseling because I just couldn't handle the frustration where I would be trying to help them. And they'd be like, oh, fuck you, bro. I'm like, yo, you're paying me to give you advice. And then you're telling me not to give you like get what the cognitive dissonance level there is like a face palm <laughs> out the back of the skull. You're coming to me for advice. You're paying me a lot of money an hour to give you this advice. And then when I give you the advice, you're being like, nah, not, not my experience. I've talked to, you know, hundreds of women. Oh, dude. I know man. what I'm saying. Yeah. With pickup dudes, like 
they're so hard to talk to, so hard to coach, so yeah. hard to like counsel. Very resistant. Yeah, but like this mentality, this mentality is so complex that they believe in or that they're taught. But they were taught that. Like, how yeah. did six months of being immersed in the PUA scene? Because I've seen almost nothing. Well, I don't want to say nothing like it, but it's just so crazy. <laughs> these rules, these boundaries, how to be alpha. You know, that's yeah. supplicating behavior or whatever. Yeah, man, it's terrible. God, like, where the fuck did that come from? And how did that take shape? Like, what made the human brain so desperate or hungry or whatever it is to accept these bizarre factors of society? Because it's wrong. It's not It's not the truth, you know? No, you're absolutely right, man. It's like, the, the way I look at it is, well, first, first off, interesting point, um, almost every single guy, like I don't know a stat off the top of my head, but almost every single guy I've ever met through the um, PUA community doesn't have uh, a positive relationship with their dad or their dad wasn't around altogether. That includes me. Yeah. I never I never really got positive feedback from my from my dad. He actually disowned me. We didn't talk about that earlier, but you know, you shared a lot. I don't mind telling you some personal stuff as well. When I was um thirteen, he just straight up told me, like, you're a piece of shit, don't talk to our family anymore, we want nothing to do with you. And so that obviously did a number on my self esteem. And I I found a really similar thing through a lot of guys is they're craving male validation and they don't understand how to get that and they're so afraid of being put down or made secondary because they've endured it for so long that it's like welled up and it's welled up and it's yeah. welled up and when they try to walk a line or be reasonable because they're so insecure about it, it, it eats them up that oh what if somebody else perceives me in that way. They just can't handle the fact that maybe somebody else thought they were you know, beta or whatever term you want to use and so they take it to the total other extreme. They have no healthy balance. and. The, the sad thing is is that you need advice to get better, but the first advice they got before these guards went up was don't take advice that's beta, you know, yeah. be your own man, be alpha as fuck, you know, lord of the club, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's, man, I'll tell you, man, I've never really been an alpha dude. <laughs> it's, no, it's I mean neither. Being, being alpha is fucking crazy. It's yeah. just not what's, – what's the point of that? I like to be um, – I don't know. I'm like a teamwork guy. And in sports, I usually play a support role. In basketball, I played point guard. Soccer, I played midfield. You know that kind of stuff. I've always been somebody who helps enrich other people. I I, I do that a lot. And there's nothing. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You don't need to be a fucking turbo athlete, like meathead guy. Like why, where did the idea that that's a good goal come from? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's such a trip, but it's interesting. You brought up that guys in the seduction scene need, uh, this male validation. Cause I never thought of it that way, but it's so true. It's yeah. so like you, as soon as you said it, you can see it that <laughs> yeah. all the lays, all the boasting, all that sort of stuff. And actually my friend Jason Savage would say this all the time too, but it's all for men, all for yeah. men to accept them so that they can be a man and whatever, yeah. shit, you know, or whatever it is, you know, but that's, that's really what it is rather than like, the fulfillment of women actually comes nowhere into play. Nah, women are, they look at the language, man, target, you yeah. know, object, you know, like HB, this, right. yeah. it's in the language of it, it's in the culture of it. And you said, you know, where does this come from in our brain? I would say that it's from 50,000 years of a tribal mentality where as you age, there's always been rituals. There's always been a point in your life where the guys who came before you and like kind of blazed the trail and established like the communities have passed the torch down and said, now you are good enough. You are worthy, like go into the world kind of thing. And if you don't have that, you're constantly wondering, you're like, am I there yet? What, like at what point, when am I a man? When, yeah. when am I good enough? Yeah, man. Uh, and I'll, I'll even say this, like, uh, we get into like the anthropology, which was like kind of the whole point of my myth of the alpha male thing is, is, you know, human <clears throat> beings, we've had society so minuscule amount of time that we didn't, we didn't even have awesome. tribes, you know, we like that took a long time to get up to, you know, to get 10 people to stick together, to <laughs> yeah. order, order. It sounds like nothing, but that, that like was fucking, you know, 90% of human history, but really like 99.9 seven percent of history has had agriculture had an attempt at society 
And it the last real 3,000 years or 2,000 years of connecting, that's 0.01%. Mm-hmm. That means out exactly. of like a, if there were 1,000 people representing this, one person, one person is who we d- have decided to look to because it's the one in front of us. It's the one next to us, basically, yeah. of what our human potential is. And we ignore the 999 other people or, or whatever it is, examples of which, you know, probably had some really fucked up, surely had fucked up shit. You know, we lived shorter, all this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. But our nature of happiness, our nature of emotion, our nature of connection, our nature of being social and being sexual, you know, was all developed then. And, you know, fuck, we, we buy into, you know, the billboard, the commodification, the fucking being cool. And what's so weird, especially being at seduction conventions, is seeing what guys resonate with, like who are really, who've bought into the scene. Yeah. And they resonate almost 100% with the most full of shit person. It's crazy. It's so frustrating, right? You just want to be, you do not see that this guy is fake. And when you try yeah. to call him out, it's like, oh, you keyboard warrior, you don't know. And like, you just yeah. can't. Get yeah, man, it's totally fucked up. And I honestly say like, man, if I want to be really critical, if you're buying into a guy that says approaching makes you better, or helps your sex life or helps your mentality fucking fuck them and which is pretty much everybody because that that is so far from the truth i don't know anybody that approaches who has friends they have pickup friends like i don't know people that are really into approach that's what i mean they're just not normal cool guys they don't have have friends They, they, they don't have a good viewpoint on women whatever the second thing would be is uh do they believe in like dominance and this leadership or whatever uh because I've never known a guy who really promoted that, who had that, that if you looked at his personal life, if it was there, it was never there. It's fucking crazy. It's, it's nuts. They, yeah, they have, they don't have come from anything. Like we talked about culture in our, in our previous talk. I think it to some extent has something. Come here before you leave. No, she's camera shy. Um, they don't have anything they're coming from. Like yeah. the the cool guys I know who are really successful with women, just kind of like naturally, they've always just been getting laid, having girlfriends and stuff. They have substance to their personality. They have standards. They have things they believe, things they like. They have hobbies and interests. And I think you know that's a piece of it. Sure, there's a lot of people who say, well, if you get all that, you're not gonna, you know, women aren't gonna flock to you. That's true because people who grew up with that. We're also going out and gaining experience from the time they were like, say, 12 to you know, 20 or whatever and forming beliefs about how to interact and how to have relationships. So, yeah, if you just get that part of it, well, then you have to go get experience. So my, my philosophy personally to solve that problem is like, OK, so I have that aspect of my life down now. I'm just going to go and see what happens. If you try to procrastinate to the point where you're anticipating problems like a thousand steps ahead of time, what's the point of that? You're not going to encounter 99% of it. You just get out there. When you encounter an obstacle, then look up like, okay, so what's what am I doing or something? And encounter the obstacle a bunch of times too. It could have been a fluke. Maybe the other person was having a bad day. Like, you never know, man. Yeah. Yeah, no, man, it's it's a crazy thing. It's funny because my goal right now, I actually, I'd like to know your opinion on this, of what you would want to see. I'm going to do a bunch Can of- Can I get a quick opinion on something? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? A female opinion. Let me- yeah. <laughs> no, but- uh, Are you AMOGing me? Dude, totally, 100% of the time. Man, you know, back to the whole AMOG thing. I got very good at meeting girls and having sex and it had nothing to do with alpha. It had everything to do with isolation. Like if I isolated her away from the alpha dudes or isolated her away from any, like I could be a fucking whatever. I could be a dirty, homeless, clueless motherfucker with no value. But as long as I could isolate and talk to her, connect with her, uh, I mean, shit, dude, that's, yeah. that's what worked for me, you know? Um, but, but Makes not necessarily sense. what worked for me for happiness, functionality, relationship, yeah. sex, totally, sex, totally, thing, totally yeah. different deal, which is what people should be fucking talking about. But, uh, oh yeah. Okay. So in seduction, I want to actually do a bunch of like normal born to be social, born to be sexual in field videos. This is my oh, new goal. Man. What would that look like? What would you want to see? I mean, how I'm doing it. I've only done it two days and I'm just going around saying hi to people and smiling, asking about the day, asking the meaning of their life. And, you know, I'm pretty good at like getting into conversations and all that sort of stuff. But what yeah. is it would that would be helpful 
seeing that you, man, you have seen the seduction scene, you have a good relationship, you know, you kind of get what it's about. You get what's bullshit. You get what's not. Yeah. What would you want to see in that? I would want to see exactly what you're doing. I would want to see guys going out and not having some objective like, you know, getting numbers or pulling girls. Um, I'd want to see you going out and what does a conversation look like with just intention to connect? You know, how different is the interaction when a guy's like being conscious of something like what stage of seduction they're in and what you know, moves they need to do socially, what, what kind of social techniques they need to do to advance the interaction yeah. versus somebody who's going out without any of that shit in mind yeah. and is just going like, I, I'm just genuinely curious about your life. Tell me, personally, I think that would work better. And I'm sure there are like 101 does, pickup yeah. artists who will disagree with me on that or might send me hate mail or whatever. But if you're just going like, and I'm not saying doing, but if you genuinely are just interested in people, you know, and yeah. what they go through, they feel yeah. that, man. And yeah. that's what I would want to see is like go out there and just connect with people in a real way. And it doesn't, I, I don't want the focus to be, you know, oh, this guy didn't get a kiss close. What a fucking loser. He shouldn't be teaching guys shit. Ha ha. Like who cares about that stuff? And who cares about pandering to that crowd? Go out and just straight connect with people. And if you get a friendship from it, cool. If you know it yeah. turns to business or something, cool. Totally. If you know it turns out that she thinks you're hot or whatever, cool. Like, but who cares where it goes? The point yeah. isn't to steer it; it's just to connect. And I think it's it's funny because uh, what we talk about when I'm teaching and with my groups and all sort of stuff and. Like I say, it works better is basically because if I know all the pickup skills in the world, which like I became very good at, and you know, would still use, but I do them with that motive. You know, I end up with some good times, end up with some lays, end up with some sex, but not necessarily happy. But if I'm like traveling and I just, you know, for the sake of traveling or say, hey, what's going on? No, oh, man, I've never been here. And just saying hi to people and having that sort of like curiosity or, or whatever, just need to talk to people. I always have a good time. I always end up with some cool stuff. Yeah, totally. I, I have ended up in many relationships from that. I've ended up with like probably the best stories, but I ended up with the skills that taught me how to be like social, have relationships with people and connect. And what's interesting is also what you said, so to bring up pickup terms, the whole idea of qualification, how we did determine it is that everybody, you know, has some sort of connection. But if you only think your qualification is to fuck some chick, then you're massively limiting the situation. When you get to yeah. know somebody, when you hit rapport, they know you, you know them, you're starting to build that bridge. Your idea of qualification should be, okay, where do we fit in each other's lives or do we? Maybe we don't. Yes, exactly. You know? That's, that's uh, the best relationship can yeah. sometimes be one that never happened. Sometimes mm -hmm. the best relationship, the best gift you can give somebody is a one night stand. Sometimes yeah. it's your entire life. Who knows what it is? The only way to know, though, is to just put yourself out there and see what happens. If you yeah. go out there and you're trying to like filter yourself, and present yourself in all these different ways, like maybe that person would have really liked you. Putting on a persona can serve a function, but the cost of putting on a persona right. is you'll never know who would have really liked who you really are, man. You have and no that's chance of fulfillment, man. Exactly. That's an awful thing to miss out on. Is it's a connection. TSL principle is if you get rejected or something like, you know, in, in a pickup sense. But uh, we always say there's two reasons. Number one, you didn't have the technique to express yourself. So that means that could be you didn't do the fucking sequence of crazy social dynamics. Right. But it was to express yourself. And the second thing is that you just weren't qualified to talk to each other. Yeah. It wasn't supposed to happen. There's so nothing wrong sucks. with that. I mean, if like, it does suck, but if you I mean, like her and she doesn't like you, it sucks. But yeah, it feels shitty. But I mean, the only way you're going to find somebody who is mutually compatible with yourself is to be able to put yourself out there and do it a bunch of times. And you'll experience rejection a bunch of times. Yeah. And I wouldn't call that failure personally because now you know you have one less person, like one name off your list of somebody that isn't a match for you. There's one last thing that I want to talk to you about or one maybe sure. topic and we've talked about it, but you had mentioned something in this last little kind of like blurb of whatever is in terms of addiction or in terms of doing something wrong. Um, but it kind of flagged in my head because you were saying, hey, and I was in Toronto, we were partying. 
drinking, doing drugs or whatever. And then previous in the conversation, it was like, nobody does any wrong. And when we do something in like putting a drug in our body, whatever mm -hmm. that is, like alcohol, speed, cocaine, heroin, yada, yada, yada. When we're doing that, and you had said before that it was like an escape of something. Let me put this into perspective for the general public. Every time you're doing something for yourself and your own benefit, it is to do that. Whether that's turning on the radio, singing along to a song, or something along those lines. And I think what's so fucking crazy about addiction, hate, blame, this obsession and compulsion that gears towards one thing outside of ourself that's trying to find you know, the solution to the answer within or the, the problem within is it all comes down to that. It came from a point of alleviation. You know, it came from a point of like, Hey, I want to feel good. But I think the real turning point in that is like finding that thing outside of ourselves. The beautiful thing that I think are about drugs and that helped my life so much, man, I, I love them. I love chemicals and I love what they did to me. They fucking destroyed me, man. Just fucking, I mean, Jesus Christ, like, eh, whatever, you know, your, your bottom's where you stop digging or whatever, but fucking destroyed my shit, right? Humbled me in ways that, you know, I, th I thought, you know, every kid thinks they're invincible, but man, I've proved. Oh, I've drugs proved will fix that problem, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but see, the problem with things like resentment or blame or other things, they don't do shit. You know, one of the biggest problems with a gambling addiction is that it fucks you up. It fucks you up bad, but man... I mean, drugs, it's so much quicker. The biggest problem with like a porn addiction or a sex addiction is that it just doesn't, it doesn't hit you hard enough. You know, it's not so obvious. It hits you hard. Okay. I don't want to minimize that stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a part of all of them. But when you mix in that shit that really can destroy you, man, it, it fucking, it does. And it makes a very clear message you know, <laughs> where you are holed up in the smallest room of the house, wanting more hoarding and being alone from everybody, you know, and that is your life. And, uh, it, it's very, very consistent. But when we see this, like kind of like dysfunction and the solution to this function in society of people getting all fucked up and out of whack, man, how is it that, where do we go with that? Where do we go with like, hey, you were just trying to do better. You were just trying to hear the new song on the radio, but it just turned into fucking sticking a needle in your arm or turned into getting a hooker or turned into whatever it was. Man, how how do we work with this like addiction-based society and mentality that has gotten so far out of hand, man? Are, are you asking like um, what do how to general, deal with like, how yeah, to deal well, with addiction or well, like how do you help an addict that, or okay we can start with that but what i'm shooting for in the long run is what what do we do as a society and culture to start to look oh, forward? society um well as a society for one we got to change our attitudes on addiction in general for one the war on drugs that america started i think it was reagan who started it or something i'm not too familiar nixon. with u.s history to be honest nixon um thank you i would have really dumb if i kept going with hey, that man, reagan, uh, reagan put some miles on that son of a bitch too <laughs> there you go it's a little bit of redemption but it, it created this whole like look at only now is weed being legalized uh, and it, it's not like evidence for it being positive or at least evidence that it's not as bad as it's purported to be is just coming out it's been there for a long time it's that people don't like to believe it and like I said earlier as long as we have this fundamental denial of problems as being based on character rather than circumstance it's going to persist i think personally and if, it could be me being biased because i really love psychology but um i think personally one of the big things would be the understanding that who you are isn't like the static unmoving concept it's like you plus the environment and as the environment changes around you and as different things happen so you change as well you're the sum of the environment plus you and not just in the long run but as a second to second basis like as you speak i change in very small ways yes. but i'm still changing you know what i mean and as long as we continue to believe that you know addicts are bad the bad people addiction is bad it's a choice you know we need education man we need to 
enlightened people about this stuff, we need to do like what Amsterdam's crime statistics are ridiculously low compared to even even Canada um, in terms of drug related violence yeah. and drug related crime because they have a better understanding. Like we talked about earlier, it's important to be accurate, right? If you perceive accurately, you have more accurate information, you make better, more accurate decisions that produce better results. And they have it down and we don't. We're sitting here, like the incarceration rate in the States, I think is also pretty crazy. I mean, like it's, I, yeah, it's out of control, man. I'm, I'm not too informed about it, but from what I've heard, it's absolutely like ballistic compared to other places. Yeah. Like people are getting thrown in jail for doing drugs. And what, what message does that send to the rest of the society in terms of addiction? And then if addiction to drugs or whatever is worthy of that, it kind of spills over into other areas, doesn't it? Where it's like, if you're addicted to this thing, you must have a lot in common with these people who are addicted to this and who are in jail. Yeah. You know, and so it kind of, there's this whole stigma around it. Yeah. No, man, it's, it's totally fucked up. Uh, you know, I'll tell you a quick story. My, my friend is in prison right now for a drug charge. Oh, shit, this man. guy is, I think three or four years clean. Uh, he got thrown in prison at two years clean, great member of society. And, but here's where the solution comes into play. And this is where, I like talking about the guy because I look up to him this way. We write back and forth and all that sort of stuff. You oh, know, cool. In those two years, he did a lot of good stuff for himself. He cleaned up a lot of shit, you know, did a lot of good work, you know, was definitely a good member of society while working through his own stuff. Showed up to court for, you know, a case like you have these trials every 30 days. They kind of reassess something and they're like, nope, you're going to jail today. So he, he went to prison and, uh, you know, he took it upon himself. He's like, Hey man, I did some fucked up shit. I'm going to do the time. I'm going to be spiritual about it. You know, yada, yada, yada. All, and has I couldn't do that. No, man, it's amazing. There's no blame. There's no resentment. There's no fucking yeah. anger. There's no whatever. Wow. And he, and he's like, dude, I did. I was, you know, whatever it was that he was doing, selling crack or got caught with. And that's a fucked up drug, man, because the, oh, yeah. the charges in it in the U S are just out of control. But, uh, and I don't know if that's what it was, but, but, um, he had some possession charge and, uh, man, he uh he has this positive mentality. He's probably getting out pretty soon. And uh it's it sucks, but there isn't any blame in that. And that's really a beautiful thing to see. Now that being said, on an individual level, if you want to be happy, I feel whatever your problem is, that's what you have to do. But once you get that handled, at some point, man, if we're gonna all live together in this world, we have to change the way we view things and how the laws are because they're not helping anybody he is the one percent if it's fucking one percent that prison did not infinitely make them a more screwed up fucked up person yeah more resentful person and everything eh? yeah that's wild man good for him that's a really tough thing to do i don't know if i could if i could go through it i'd probably flee the country if i ever had to face a, a jail sentence man you know the jail thing's effective for me i think having my freedom taken away is scary as fuck dude yeah. i would not cope well with that at all i i'm not good with authority and restrictions and limitations you know like the the first weekend i met my um, my woman we took off to the ocean first time i ever went to the pacific we just like took off drove like you know 1200 miles together we didn't even really know each other and that's you know if you're in jail it's like the exact opposite of that it's like this yeah um, that being said, you talked about addiction. What about for people who are violent offenders or experienced violence? Yeah. Uh, would you say the same thing that we have to have a new mentality about that? I would say we need a new mentality regardless of the offense. Um, and again, I'm not saying do it with punishment. That's a big criticism of people who hold similar views to mine. Right. Um, but, but the thing is punishment, if you look at behavioral conditioning, it's so well established, man, yeah. and there's so much research yeah. that totally. there's no reason we should be holding on to these old, outdated views. Straight punishment doesn't work, especially when it's super delayed. Like all the ways we do it, it just don't work. So yeah. yeah, you need to have punishment there as a deterrent, absolutely. But you also need to be able to find these people, figure out why are you doing this, and how can we help you change that. Because look at it, these people, like you said, man, we share this world, whether we like it or not, there might be some people I really don't like, but if I'm in a society with them, my best option, the, the thing that will produce the absolute best results for me and for the group is for us to take that person and help them and help them change their behavior instead of just, you know, throwing them in jail or whatever. You know, this is interesting. 
I don't have this thought fully thought through, but it does kind of fit my overall philosophy of what I believe in. But as a group or as a society, as a unified whatever, we see judgment. But as an individual, and to truly remain an individual on a one-on-one -on -one basis, we find compassion. And uh, I think in a general message of what I would have to say, like I said, I haven't thought this through with every scenario, but in a general message, what I would have to say is, Anybody who's caught in judgment, go back to the individual and go back to just, you know, if you hate something, don't necessarily talk to that, but talk to the one person in front of you rather than talking to the one person in front of you through your cause or through your social template and fucking, you know, but we say at TSL, go back to saying hello, you know, go back to connecting, go back to getting back to basics. Eh? Yeah, man, man. Cool stuff, dude. I got to get out of here. I've gone way too long. And <laughs> yeah. Where are we at? Actually, I haven't even been paying attention. It's 630 your time, 730 my time. Holy shit. We've been talking for two and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we had Holy the technical fuck, problems at the beginning. Yeah. So I guess two hours still man. two hours. That's, that's yeah. Good awesome. stuff, man. Actually very brain stimulating. Uh, I told my guys, I was like, cause I just interviewed Zan a couple days ago. I was like, yeah, hey, I'm actually going to, I did a preview interview with this guy and talked to him and I was like, dude, this is going to be some bomb ass shit. So very cool. Yeah, You, you know what, man? It's awesome. You have me on. Thank you so much. It was wicked talking with you and, and having these kind of conversations. I'd be happy down the line if, you know, we nail down another topic to Hell yeah. come back sometime, maybe do like a more focused, like shorter thing. At some yeah. Point. Hopefully if guys are listening to this and you liked it, man, write down some questions because we talked about a lot of stuff. We talked about relationships. Yeah. I was wondering how you're going to edit it. Yeah. You know, being a psychopath, being a you know, whatever, a sociopath, no more psychopath. So a lot of crazy stuff. Squirrel. You know, yeah, like, exactly. holy shit. <laughs> well, cool, man. Yeah, where do people find you? Uh, all that sort of stuff. What can they expect? You know, what kind of questions can people email you and ask you? Yeah, if you want to if you want to ask me anything about um, relationships, uh, one area of psychology I focus on a lot is identity and identity development. So how you became who you are, how that impacts the world, the idea that we all have programming, which you know we do, and how that programming is affecting your life. Um, patterns of behavior you don't like and want to change. Pretty much anything related to the psychology of identity and behavior or with relationships, depression, anxiety. Send me those questions. I'd be more than happy to answer. Um, you can reach me at ryananswers.com or you can just email me directly at ryan at ryananswers.com. Do you ever do Skype therapy or is it only just yeah, one? Yeah, no, all the, all the time I, I do Skype um, just because actually most of my clients um, over Skype are from Jersey, which is random. I, I don't know why. But a lot of people in that state. Yeah, could be, man. A lot of, a lot of interesting people. Some of my most interesting clients are well, from hey, Jersey. Hey, so. hopefully uh, we open you up to you know some guys in Australia, yeah. guys in the U.S. Oh, and, that'd be wild, man. Yeah, I appreciate the exposure. Africa. It's great. I actually, at some point, I want to interview you because all these things, you keep asking me these questions. I'm like, I feel like a dick. I, I, maybe it's just having the script reverse. I'm so used to counseling people and asking them questions that when I get to speak, I feel like I'm being selfish. You know what I maybe mean? Next time I wanted to hear we'll a lot of your opinions. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, maybe next time we'll do that. But cool stuff, man. I got to right, get out of here. There's a crying yeah, baby. For sure. woman. You know what it's oh, like. Oh, shit. Oh, buddy, do I ever. <laughs> all right, man. Good oh, talk Thanks again, you. buddy. Take care. Awesome stuff. Latest. Peace. Hey, thank you so much for watching this. This is a passion project of mine. I loved shooting this interview and I love broadcasting it out to the world. I love your comments on YouTube. Uh, man, I love your interactions. I love your email, Steve at The Sexual Life. Go to thesexuallife.com slash Ryan Answers. Find out more of what we are all about. And man, look, I really appreciate this. Let's get into this dialogue. Let's create a connection across the world to be an authentic expression of ourselves, to be born to be social, born to be sexual. And look. You were born to be your expression, and that's a happy one. All right. Thanks so much for watching. Talk to you guys on the next episode.